Hi, I'm Rod Anderson, and you're watching me today because you have requested and received the 25 Orchard Faith of Jesus Bible Reading Guides, and you are ready to start number two now. Now, we looked at number one, but if you haven't studied number one or you haven't seen the first presentation, please go back there because there's quite a bit of additional information that you won't get here which will help you not only to navigate your way around the Bible but it gives explanations of why we use the type of Bible we use which is the King James or the New King James Version Bible and uh, the, the reason why I want you to check the sources that I use and I want you to check the Bible verses that I go to and uh, the way that each one of these study guides is set up. We have a, a basic format to each one, but I give plenty of information which will help you understand why things are done the way they are in each one of these study guides and for good reason. Now, if you haven't received these study guides, it's very easy for you to do. All you have to go to is uh, send me an email uh, to the email address at info at theorchardmelbourne.org.au that is info at theorchardmelbourne.org.au or go to our website theorchardmelbourne.org.au go to the tab mark contact us follow the prompts and we will mail them to you wherever you are in the world and remember they are absolutely free now for those of you who are ready to study number two we don't have to go into too much detail. You know uh, what's needed, so let's commence right now. So, our study guide is called What the Bible Teaches About God. Our first study was What the Bible Teaches About Itself. This one is called What the Bible Teaches About God. So let's commence now. The first subheading is Who is God? And question number one asks, How many gods are are there. So again, we're in the New Testament. We're going to Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 6. Now remember, we have Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, Acts and Romans. So let's go there now. Matthew, Mark, Luke and John. We're in the New Testament, Acts and Romans. And then we have 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians. We have um, Galatians. And then we have the book that we're after by uh, by the Apostle Paul called Ephesians. And we're at Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 6 now. All right, here we go. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 6, these are the words of the Apostle Paul. And the question asks, how many gods are there? And here the Bible says very clearly, succinctly, one God and one Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. So how many gods are there? There's one. Now, you may remember I, from number one, from study number one, I said to you that any time that you need to have more time to find the verses or to write your answer down, just press pause. Okay, and that's quite all right. Press pause. And then when you're ready to recommence, just press play again. Okay, here we go. We're going on to question number two now. What is God able to do that no one else can? Well, our first text is found in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1. Right at the beginning of the Bible, Genesis chapter 1 in the Old Testament, Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1, and it says this. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Well, look at the question again. What is God able to do that no one else can do? He created the heavens and the earth. Now, when it says that God created the heavens and the earth, the Bible actually refers to three types of heaven. There is our atmospheric heaven in which we live here. There is the stellar heavens, which contains the moons, the planets and the suns. And then we have the place where God lives or the abode of the angels and, and God, etc., which is the third heaven. But here the Bible tells us that God is able to create something that no one else or no other being is able to do. Let's turn to our next text now. And as you look at your study guide, you'll see that it's Exodus chapter 20 and verse 11. So we have Genesis and the second book of the Bible is Exodus. Let's go there now. Exodus chapter 20 and verse 11. Now, interesting Exodus chapter 20 is where we have the Ten Commandments. And we're actually reading a portion of the fourth commandment. And in verse 11, it says this. 
For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and he hallowed it. Again, it's re-emphasizing the fact that God is the creator. He created the heavens and the earth. And the Bible says that he did it in six 24-hour days. Now, on some of these questions, you'll find that there are just one verse. There's just one verse to look at. There may be two or there may be three. But in this occasion, we do have three um, uh, texts that we have to look up. And our next one is in the book of Isaiah. Now, from last week or from our previous study, you'll remember I said that to find the book of Isaiah, we just simply open the Bible and are roughly in the middle. Now, the middle of the Bible is actually the book of Psalms, but because many Bibles have maps and they'll have uh, indexes at the back and they'll have a concordance or a dictionary at the back, then it adds on 200, maybe 100, 350 pages, something like that. So in order to counter that, what we do to find the book of Isaiah, we just go into the middle and probably we'll come to Jeremiah or we'll come to Ezekiel, but eventually if we turn back, towards the front of the Bible, just slowly we come to the book of Isaiah. And in Isaiah chapter 40 and verse 25 and 26 now, and we're going to read this. This is God speaking. He's speaking to the prophet Isaiah. The book of Isaiah was written around 720 years before the time of Christ, and it says this. To whom then will you liken me? Now, in your Bible, you'll find that the word me there, or, or the personal pronoun me, is capital M. So me, or to whom shall I be equal, says the Holy One. Lift up your eyes on high and see who has created these things, who brings out their host by number. He calls them by name, by the greatness of his might and the strength of his power, not one is missing. So again, it's re-emphasizing the fact that God is the creator of all things, all org living organisms in the physical world and the natural world as well. Now, interestingly, when you study the Bible, and you'll discover this more and more, you'll see it for yourselves. When we're studying any one particular subject, instead of going to a, an isolated verse to build up a whole theology, what you want to do to have a proper understanding of what the Bible says on any subject is go to every text in the Bible that refers to that subject. For example, if I'm doing a study on the uh, subject of baptism, then I'll go to every text in the Bible which refers to baptism, and that way I'll have a very good understanding of what God wants me to know about the proper um, procedures and the proper mode of baptism. The same applies with any, any, any other subject, whether it's the second coming, whether it's Christian behaviour, whether it's the Ten Commandments, it's whatever. We go to the whole Bible from Genesis all the way down to Revelation. And this is what we do in order to keep ourselves consistent with the Word of God. Let's continue on now. Question number three. What else makes God different? What else makes God different to every other created being? Well, our text is Isaiah 57, verse 15. We're already in the book of Isaiah, so let's turn to 57, chapter 57 and verse 15. And here, we're going to read this. Now, remember, as I said, press pause if you need more time to write an answer, to look up a text. Verse 15 says, For thus says the high and lofty one, who inhabits eternity, whose name is holy, I dwell in the high and holy place with him who is a contrite and humble heart, or spirit, to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite ones. Now, for the purposes of the question that we're looking at here, what else makes God different to every other created, created being? It says that God is the high and the lofty one. And it says here, who inhabits eternity. In other words, God is not restricted by time and space as we are. The Bible says that he inhabits eternity. In other words, he already knows what your life is going to be. He already knows how events are going to turn out tomorrow with you. So he is the one who is not restricted by time and place. Well, this is the first thing that makes God different to the rest of us, to every other created life form. 
that God knows the uh, end from the beginning. He inhabits uh, eternity. He's not restricted by time or space. Let's look at another text. It's found in Isaiah chapter 46. We go back a few pages, not too many. Isaiah 46 and verse 9 and 10. And here it says, Remember the former things of old, for I am God and there is none like me, or there is none other. I am God and there's none like me, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times the things that are not yet done, saying my counsel shall stand and I will do all my pleasure. What does it say here? It says that God knows the end from the beginning. He already knows how things are going to turn out in a hundred years' time. And in fact, as we study the Bible, we see that God is the originator of real prophecies that are easy to understand and easy to interpret because God is, inhabits eternity and he knows the end from the beginning. And in fact, as we study the Bible, we see that God stakes everything on his his, this statement here to be a able to foretell the future, something that no one else is able to do. Let's carry on now as we go to the book of Acts. Now, where's the book of Acts? Well, it's in the New Testament. So we have Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and then Acts. So let's turn there now. First, we'll find the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and then the book of Acts. And we're looking at Acts. Uh, chapter, what is it we want? Acts chapter 17 and verse 24 to 26 we're going to be reading from. Here, it says, God, oh, before we carry on, who was the writer of the book of Acts? Well, it's the same writer as the book of Luke. It was a uh, a man by the name of Luke, Luke, Dr. Luke, he was a Gentile, that is a non-Jew. I'm a Gentile. Many of you are probably Gentiles as well. That is, we're not Jews. And here, the book of Acts was written by a man by the name of Luke. He was a doctor. And what he does in this journal called Acts, he covers the 30 years after the ascension and resurrection, sorry, resurrection and ascension of Jesus Christ in that order. Um, for the next 30 years, he follows the development of the church and the challenges of the church. And it's a very, very interesting and compelling book when people begin to read it. But here in chapter 17, he's journalising the history of the church and here he talks of Paul and Paul is in the city of Athens. This is the Apostle Paul. And in verse 24, the Apostle Paul says this, God, who made the world and everything in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands, nor is he worshipped with men's hands as though he needed anything, since he gives to all life, breath, and all things, and he has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on all the face of the earth, and has determined their pre-appointed times and boundaries of their dwellings. What makes God different to every other created being? Well, it's simply this, that God is the one who has determined where you would live, the country you would live, and the time in which you will live, would live. Something that no other man and no other created being can do. Now, in previous, the previous study, I mentioned that in a normal situation, I would read a Bible verse. If I'm visiting in a home or if I'm doing a group Bible study with people, I would visit in a home and I would ask people to read. We can't do this in this situation here, so I'm going to have to do all the reading, of course, but I hope it doesn't become too boring, too monotone, but I'll do my best to keep it engaging. Let's go now to question number four, and the subheading there is above it is the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And question four asks, who are the three persons of the Godhead? Remember, we're going to now 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 14 is on our study guide. So we have Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, Acts, where we are now, Romans, and now we're going 
to pass Romans, we're going to pass 1 Corinthians, and we're going to go to 2 Corinthians. And in fact, we're going to the very last chapter and the very last verse in 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 14. And the question asks, what are the three persons, or who are the three persons of the Godhead? It says, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. So who are the three persons of the Godhead? God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. That's our answer there. Now there's a second text that we're to look at as well, and it's found in Colossians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9, a very important text. Now we haven't been to the book of Colossians before, but it's in the New Testament, it's the writings of Paul. It actually follows uh, the book of Corinthians here because we have 2 Corinthians, we have Galatians, we have Ephesians, then we have Philippians, and then we have Colossians. So let's turn there now. They're all very small books that the Apostle Paul wrote. And we're in Colossians chapter 2 now and verse 8 and 9. And Paul, warning the believers in Colossae, says this, Beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit according to the tradition of men, according to the basic principles of the world and not according to Christ. For in him, that is Jesus Christ, dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And you are complete in him who is the head of all principality and power. How does it describe Jesus Christ here? It says in Jesus Christ is all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. This is very important. It's very important, particularly when you have people knocking on your door like the Jehovah's Witnesses who say that Jesus is a second-rate God. He's not quite there with God the Father. He's a, he's a God with a small g. He doesn't have all the wherewithal that God the Father has. Well, we've just read from the Bible, and it actually that's contrary to what the Bible says. The Bible actually says here that in him is all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. So all the omniscience, all the omnipotence, and all, all the omnipresence that we would associate with God the Father and God the Holy Spirit is there with Jesus Christ. I hope that makes sense. Let's carry on because we're looking at the next question now. What Question number five says, what do the personal pronouns associated with the Holy Spirit teach us? Well, let's find out. Because, you know, there are a lot of people, as we go to this text now, John chapter 14, Matthew, Mark, Luke and John in the New Testament. You know, there are a lot of people today, don't know where they get it from. They don't get it, they don't get it from the Bible. They actually teach that the Holy Spirit is just a force, an impersonal force. But you only have to read a couple of verses in the Bible to challenge that whole silly notion and to actually find out what the truth is. Let's go to John chapter 14 now. We're looking at verses 16 and then we'll go straight to verse 26. John 14 verse, 20, uh, verse 16, it says, And I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper that he might abide with you forever. So Jesus says here, I will pray the Father, and he will send you another helper. Now the King James says, the comforter. So who is another helper? Who, well, let me ask you this question. Who was the first helper? Who was the first comforter? It was Jesus. Jesus says here, I will pray the Father, and he will send another comforter or another helper. And it says here that he will give, uh, that he may abide with you forever. You notice the personal pronoun there for the helper, for the counsellor. And shortly we're going to discover it's the Holy Spirit. It identifies the Holy Spirit, the counsellor, the comforter with the personal pronoun he. Notice verse 26 now. But the helper the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things. What is the Holy Spirit going to do? He will teach you. You see, this has all the attributes of a free-thinking individual, doesn't it? He will teach you. He will instruct you in all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I have said 
to you. Let's continue on now in John chapter 15 in verse 26. We just turn a page over in verse 26. But when the Helper comes, who I shall send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth, who proceeds from the Father, he will testify of me. Again, the personal pronoun, he will testify of Jesus. Let's continue on in chapter 16 and verse 7 now. Chapter 16 and verse 7. And Jesus again it says, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send, what does it say in your Bible? Him to you. Very good. So the personal pronouns identify the fact that the Holy Spirit is a person in every sense of the word. You have God the Father, you have God the Son, and you have God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Each one omniscient omnipresent and omnipotent. Question number six now. And remember, you can press pause at any time if you haven't got time to write your answers down or I'm hurrying when it comes to looking up the text. All right, question number six. How is God's character described? The first text we're looking up here is in the book of Exodus. So let's go there now. And we know where Exodus is. It's the second book of the Bible. So we have to go past Genesis. And then we come to Exodus. And we're looking at Exodus chapter 34 and verses 5 and 7. There are a lot of people, you know, who say that the God of the Old Testament is nasty, mean, vindictive, etc., etc., capricious. And the God of the New Testament, he's nice and kind and gentle and merciful. You know, the God of the Old Testament is the same God of the New Testament. The God in the Old Testament is as merciful, kind, patient, tolerant, forgiving as Jesus Christ in the New Testament. Let's look at what it says here in Je Exodus chapter 34. We're looking at verses 5 to 7 now. And it says, Now the Lord descended in a cloud and stood with him. Now the him there is Moses. And proclaimed the name of the Lord. And the Lord passed before him and proclaimed the Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long suffering and abounding in goodness and in what? And in truth. Now, the next passage that we're going to raise has caused much consternation amongst the Christian community and also has been used as fuel by enemies of God to disparage the God of the Bible and also God himself. Notice what verse 7 says, Keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and transgression and sin. Is that good news? It's very good news. But notice now, by no means clearing the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and upon the children's children, to the third and fourth generation. Now, this would be unfair if we understand it from just a, a, a superficial reading. And one of the problems is not only within Christianity itself, but outside the enemies of God, uh, outside the Bible, and that is people are just surface readers. They just skim over the surface. They don't think about what they're reading. They don't reflect truly on what they're reading. And here it talks about the sins of the fathers uh, vis uh, being visited upon the children and the children's children. Think about this. The, the example that a mother or father set for their children impacts their children. Isn't that the case? So if you have a mother or father saying there is no God, and saying that that little voice with inside you, that prompting that you sense, uh, some people call it conscious, they say, or some people call it the inner moral law, they say. Uh, they would say to their children, just override that. That's just a part of our evolutionary past. We don't need it anymore. Just override that, ignore that. Now, if that's the instruction that people are given, that there is no God, that there are no moral, there are no uh, ethical absolutes, that uh, there is no higher power, you know, we have just evolved from apes and it's the battle for the fittest, it's survival of the fittest, this sort of thing, and that um, we only have this life and so we've got to grasp and, and claw our way through it. If that's the, the doctrine, if you like, that is taught and propounded by parents, and their children embrace that doctrine, what will happen to the next generation and the generation after that? 
And that's why it's very good for you to be studying the Bible because it doesn't matter what your parents believe or what your grandparents believe. In studying the Bible and becoming acquainted with the Word of God, you actually stop the cycle of, it might be physical abuse, it might be mental and emotional abuse. You stop the, the trend of addiction and addictive behavior with uh, substance abuse and the like. You intervene, you bring God into your life. And even though this has been the trend of the past with the family, you can break that. You don't have to follow what's happened and it's happened in generations prior to your time. I hope that makes sense. Now, I don't have a lot of time to expound on this any further, but I hope you get the basic understanding of what I'm on about here. Simply this, that God desires that everybody lives a good, a happy and a fruitful life and that they would acknowledge him in throughout their journey in this life. But when a person turns away from God and they start to be, uh, they continue to be focused on their own selves and grafting and covetous, then it's going to have an impact and it's going to wash off on their children. And if it washes off on their children and they, uh, they embrace that same theology, if you like, or that same philosophy of life, then it's going to affect the children's children and the children's children after that. And that's the simple reality that uh, behavioural science teaches us. Let's continue on now as we go to this question six again. We're looking at the second passage that we're to go to and it's found in 1 John chapter 4 and verse 7 and 8. Now, remember 1 John is not the gospel of John. We have Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, the four gospels. But we're not going to the fourth gospel. We're going to the little letter which is near the end of the Bible, just before the book of Revelation. So if you get to the book of Revelation, just go back and you'll find Jude. You'll find that there's 1st, 2nd and 3rd John. We're going to go to this little epistle, the first epistle of John, and it's chapter 4 and verse 7 and 8. And the question is asking, remember, how is God's character described? Verse 7 and verse 8. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God. And everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. He who does not love does not know God, for God is what? God is love. So how is God's character described? God is love. That's the foundation to everything. And that's why he's merciful, long-suffering, kindly affection to each, to each person, patient, all these sort of things, merciful, etc., uh, etc. Et this is how God's character is described to us. Let's continue on now. We turn the page. We're on page two in the subheading here, God's love for mankind. And question seven asks, in what does God delight? We go to the book of Micah now. Now, Micah is one of the minor prophets. Sometimes it's a bit of a challenge to find. So what I'd recommend is go to the middle of the Bible and you'll come to perhaps Isaiah, Ezekiel or Jeremiah and then go towards the back of your Bible just slowly because you'll find there's the book of Daniel and you'll come across Hosea. These are all minor prophets now. There's Joel. You'll come to Amos and you'll keep turning and you're going to come to Abadiah. You'll pass Jonah as you keep flicking past. And then after Jonah, you have the book of Micah. Now, after the book of Micah, you have the book of Nahum. So if you get to Nahum or if you get to Zephaniah, you know that you've just gone a little bit too far. Go back a few pages and you'll find the book of Micah. Now, as I've said... Um, if you continue following my instruction in regarding to navigating your way around the Bible, probably by the time you get to lesson number 10 with me, you're going to be able to find your way around the Bible with absolute ease. So let's look at this passage now in uh, Micah chapter 7 and verse 18. And here it says, Who is a God like you? So this is the prophet Micah who lived about 800 years before the time of Christ, he says, Who is a God like you, pardoning iniquity and passing over the transgression of the remnant of his heritage? What does it tell us about God here? What does he delight in? Well, in this verse here, it tells us that he delights in uh, forgiveness. He delights in mercy chapter 7 and verse 18 it says that he does not retain his anger forever and then the last part of verse 18 it says because he delights in 
mercy. Isn't that good news? God delights in mercy. Let's continue on now. Question number eight. How does God describe us? Let's go to 1 John. We know where 1 John is now. It's near the end of the Bible, before Revelation. And it's that little epistle, 1 John chapter 3 and verse 1. And the question is asked, how does God describe us? It says this now. Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us, that we should be called what? The children of God. Isn't that a beautiful way to describe his followers? God describes us, identifies us as his children. Isn't that wonderful to hear that God views us as a loving, as, a, as his children and he is our loving parent. Now, some people may view God the Father through the, through, if you like, the, um, the reality of their own parent, mother or father, whatever that may, may be. The Bible's very clear that there is God the Father. But some people's view of the Father may be skewed because of their experience with their own father or with their own parents, their mother or their father. But as you study the Bible, you see that there's nobody in the entire universe who is committed to your love, care and protection more than God. So even though your earthly experience with parents may not be the best, and I, I, obviously I can't tell whether it was or whether it wasn't, but the reality is that the God of the Bible offers you something that the parents in this world, because we're all fallen, can't offer their children, and that is unconditional love, um, uh, touched with mercy, kindness and forgiveness. Well, let's continue on. It says uh, in question number nine now, how do we know that God is interested in our problems? How do we know that? Well, let's turn now to the book of Psalms. Psalms chapter 40. Remember I've said a number of times now that you can press pause at any time if you feel as though you haven't had enough time to write your answers down or to look up the verse. Now, where's the book of Psalms? Well, if we open the Bible and we go to the, close the Bible rather than we go to the middle of it, we'll probably come to Jeremiah, Ezekiel or Isaiah and then we'll just go back towards the front of the Bible a little bit slowly and we'll find the book of Song of Solomon's, Ecclesiastes, Proverbs and then we'll find the book of Psalms. But we're going to Psalms chapter 40 and we're looking at verses 1 to 3 here. In answer to the question, how do we know that God is interested in our problems? Here we go. Psalms 40 and verses 1 to 3. I waited patiently for the, for the Lord. And this is a Psalm of King David, written around about 1050 BC. I waited patiently for the Lord and he inclined to me. What does the word incline mean? Well, it's, it's like this. If you're telling me something, and my body language is like this, what does that show? Does it show that I'm really interested? You know, if I'm sort of looking everywhere and not focusing on you, when I incline to you, it's a bit like this. I lean towards you. I show that I'm interested. I'm engaging with you. The Bible says here that... Um, I waited patiently for the Lord and he inclined to me. He showed his interest and it says here, and he heard my cry. He also brought me up out of a horrible pit, out of the miry clay and set my feet upon a rock and established my steps. He has put a new song in my mouth, praise to our God. Many will see it in fear and will trust in the Lord. So it says here that the Lord inclined to David. He heard his cry. He took him out of the miry clay, which is just sticky clay. And if you walk through that sort of clay, oftentimes if your shoe isn't tied on or uh, tied up tightly, uh, you can lose it. You can leave it behind as you step forward. You can step out of your shoe because the clay is so sticky. And the Bible says here that the Lord placed him on solid rock, placed his feet on solid rock. So this is what God promises to do for us. When we come to him with our needs, with our concerns, we pray, he listens to us, and then he helps us. What's the next text? We're going to Matthew, Matthew chapter 10 and verses 29 to 31. We're in the New Testament now. Matthew chapter 10 and verse 29 to 31.
Jesus says this. Are not two, are not two sparrows sold for a copper coin? And not one of them falls to the ground apart from your father's will. But the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Do not fear, therefore, you are of more value than the sparrows. Here, we're told that sparrows are worth what? What does it say there? A copper coin, that's all. They're sold for a copper four coin. But not one of them falls to the, excuse me, not one of them falls to the ground, which goes beyond or, uh, or is not recognized or seen by the Father. However, it says there, but the very hairs of your head are numbered. Now, what does that mean? Well, it simply means this, that God knows us intimately. He knows what you're going through. And when we come to God to thank him for what has happened, or when we come to God to ask for help, or when we're seeking direction, then God hears us. And the Bible says that he answers our prayer. Well, let's go to our last question now. Our last question is question number 10. To what measure should we trust God and what is promised? I love this. This is found in Proverbs. Now, if we go to the middle of the Bible again and we find the book of Psalms, you'll find that the book of Proverbs is immediately after the book of Psalms. And Proverbs was largely written by King Solomon, who was the son of King David, around about 1,028, something like that, 1,000 and thousand BC, somewhere in that vicinity, and we're going to Proverbs chapter 3, and we're looking at verses 5 and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and lean not on your own understanding, in all your ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct your paths. The question is asked here, in what measure, measure should we trust God, and what is promised by if we trust God with all our hearts, the promise is that he will direct us. He will guide us. So we come to God. We're asking him. We're trusting him that he will guide us. And the Bible promises that he does and he will for our benefit in order to keep us safe, well and connected with him and also for those that we care for around us. Okay. So we've finished the first 10 questions. We have a bit of an understanding now of what the Bible is referring to when it comes to the subject of God himself. But now what I want you to do is look at the summary question and summarize God's attitude towards you. Now, go back over the answers that you saw earlier or that you wrote down earlier. Perhaps even go to some of the verses that you looked up. But summarize God's answer to you. And you've got a few lines to do that. Remember to press pause and then press play when you're finished. All right, let's go to the reflection question now. Now, the reflection questions, as I said in the first study, they ask us to not only understand what the Bible says, but how does it apply to my life today? How can it, it happen into the world in which we live today? So this is the purpose of the reflection questions. And we have two today. And the first one says, how can you honour God in your life? Well, review the questions that we asked earlier and the texts that we look up. How can you honour God in your life? Well, if it was me, I would be saying I honour God in my life by the way I treat my wife, the way I treat my children, my attitude to other people around me, uh, these sort of things. That's the way I honour God in my life. It's by my own behaviour, my attitude to things. Now, the but that's not, that's not your answer. What would your answer be as you think about that? Now we're going to question number two. What part does love play in our relationship with God? Well, we have to admit that love is a, the very platform upon which every act uh, is generated from. I prove that I love my wife by doing nice things for her, for being faithful to her, for being, uh, to, for being considerate, uh, you know, picking up mess, helping with things around the house. This is how I demonstrate my love for uh, my wife and also for my children as well. I do things that I know can help them, that can help them to be successes in their lives. So how does love play in our relationship with God? Well, as we respond to God's great love to us, as we experience day by day, I show how much I appreciate him by the things that I do. But what's your answer? 
Now we're going to the resolution section. I believe in God the Father, God the Son and God the Holy Spirit. I'm grateful that I'm a recipient of God's love and am his child. Now remember this resolution section is a bit like if you were to come to my church and uh, I ask a question at the end of the church service. I say, did that make sense to you? Or come forward if you believe that God is calling you to respond. You know, words to this effect. And what you're doing there is you're putting up your hand and you're moving from your seat, you're coming forward, whatever the case may be. You're showing that the words that I've shared with you in the message for the day have actually impacted your heart and you do understand and you want to live by them. The same applies here with this resolution. But instead of putting up your hand or walking forward or filling in a response card, whatever the case may be, you're writing your name and then you're signing it there on the study guide itself. Now, let's go to the additional study guide and as I've said already in study number one, this adds more flesh to the bone All right, of our study. Additional study. From the Bible we learn there is one God revealed in three persons, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit. The Bible tells us that God is the creator of man, the earth and the universe. Now, remember... In a normal circumstance, if I'm doing Bible studies in a home or in a group setting, I would get you to read or I'd get other people to read, but obviously that can't happen here. So I have to do all the reading and I hope I'm not going to be too boring. Please don't fall asleep. I'll try and make it interesting and engaging as I read on. Here we go. Second paragraph says, God is known to us. God reveals himself to us through nature, upon our consciences, in the Bible, through the life, death, resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ and through the ministry of the Holy Spirit and by the witness of others. God wants us to trust him. Our God is a God of love. We learn from the scripture that the Father wants us to trust and love him. He wants us to understand that as we come to him, he will help us in our time of need and will not leave us. Even when we make terrible mistakes, God wants us to come to him knowing he accepts us mercifully. He comforts us when we are in pain. He fills our life with his presence so that we are content, bringing peace to our restless hearts. God's love. One Christian writer has said this, nature and revelation alike testify of God's love. Our Father in heaven is the source of life, of wisdom and of joy. Look at the wonderful and beautiful things of nature. Think of their marvellous adaptation to the needs and happiness, not only of man, but of all living creatures. The sunshine and the rain that gladden and refresh the earth, the hills and seas and plains, all speak to us of the Creator's love. It is God who supplies the daily needs of all his creatures. In the beautiful words of the psalmist, the eyes of all look expectantly to you, referring to the Father, and you give their food in due season. You open your hand and satisfy the desire of every living thing. Need of God. The misfortunes and sufferings of humanity are the end result of being distant from God. The prophet Jeremiah demonstrates how this is played out in the lives of men and women. For my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and hewn themselves cisterns, broken cisterns that can hold no water. The only solution is to return to God. Dr. Andrew Conway Ivey, the famous professor of Illinois University, said, To believe in God provides the only and most complete and rational meaning to our universe. The marvellous thing is, as soon as we step toward God, we will find him waiting us, awaiting us with love and mercy. The existence of God. Some people say, I do not believe in God because I cannot see him. But there are many things in this life that we believe in without seeing them, such as electricity, wind, gravity and love. We accept that they are real without seeing them. We feel their effects without being able to touch them. The Bible warns, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. In this psalm, King David uses the Hebrew word Nabal, for fool, which describes a person who is deficient morally or intellectually or both. 
The noble fool is one who lacks wisdom and knowledge or moral values and spiritual insight. This person rejects what is plainly obvious, that being the person of God, who has made himself known to every man, woman and child. Complexity of life. The existence and complexity of life shows that there must be a designer at work. Living things are extremely com complex with numerous design features. Atheists acknowledge that the things look designed, but evolution is their attempt to explain design away along with the designer God. Living things also contain enormous quantities of genetic information. Information can only come from an intelligent being. The Bible testifies that God is the designer. What do scientists say about God? Sir Isaac Newton, who lived from 1642 to 1727, the famous discoverer of universal gravity and many, many other things, probably the greatest mind that has ever walked the earth since King Solomon said this. The admirable order of the planets and comets cannot proceed if not from the plan of the omniscient and omnipotent. God is divine, wise and omnipotent, a being that is above all and infinitely wise. Blaise Pascal, who lived from 1623 to 1662, was a French mathematician, physicist, inventor, writer and theologian. Pascal also published many books proving the existence of God. His most influential theological work, Penzies, which is translated thoughts, was a defense of Christianity. His last words were, may God never abandon me. Trust in God. In the Bible, we can find marvelous promises for those who trust and love God. For example, all things work together for good to those who love the Lord. Romans 8 verse 28. If God is for us, who can be against us? Romans chapter 8 verse 31. And God shall supply all your needs according to his riches, riches found in Philippians chapter 4 verse 19. Ellen White, in the book Steps to Christ, wrote, God is love, is written upon every opening bud, upon every spire of springing grass. The lovely, the, the lovely birds make their air vocal, make the air vocal with their happy songs. The delicately tinted flowers in their perfection perfuming the air. The lofty trees of the forest with their rich foliage of living green all testify to the tender fatherly care of our God and to his desire to make his children happy. The word of God reveals his character. He himself has declared his infinite love and pity. When Moses prayed, show me thy glory, the Lord answered, I will make all my goodness pass before thee. In Exodus chapter 33, verse 18 and 19, he is slow to anger and great of great kindness because he delights in mercy. Wonderful words. And that's the end of our additional reading now. But we also have another uh, practice. Uh, just as we've opened our time of study together in prayer, we also close it in prayer. Remember, if you have any questions, write to the address that's now on the screen. Uh, there may be some explanations that you need more light on or more understanding on, or you may have other questions that have come from this study number two. Please write them down, uh, send them through to us, and we will get back to you as quickly as possible. And I will do what I can to actually personally read your emails and get back to you myself. Well... Our time is finished now. It's been wonderful being with you. I hope that this study, uh, what the Bible teaches about God, has been a blessing for you. Let's just close our, way, our eyes in prayer now as we finish. Father in heaven, we want to thank you now as we uh, have reflected on this important study about your goodness, your mercy, your kindness, that we get a better understanding of who you are and, and how true it is that you do love us, that when the Bible says that God is love, we see it in the things that we see around this world, in the beautiful things of nature, but we also know within our own hearts that you are merciful, kind and eager to forgive and you identify us as your children. We thank you for the promises of your word. We thank you for your care and your protection. And we thank you for Jesus Christ, our Lord and Saviour. And it's in his dear name that we pray. Amen.
Well, I look forward to being with you next time. We're going to be studying study number three, which is, I think it is what the Bible teaches about Jesus Christ. I look forward to being with you next time. Goodbye for now.